Uh, it's now uh, 7.30, so I think we'll make a, make a start. Welcome to everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, two deputies here. Just to uh, remind everybody that uh, the deputies can participate in the discussion, but they do not. Uh, they are not allowed to vote. Um, so we'll move straight on to the minutes. Do you have any issues with the minutes as they last <coughs> July? If not, I'll sign them. Just a moment. Uh, apologies. Chairman, I've got apologies from councillors. Julian McGee, someone else, and Philip Murphy. Thank you. Uh, any declarations of interest? Yeah. Um, I wish to declare personal interest in item 56 with regard to councillor Cummins. I was a non-executive non director of WBC Holdings Limited. I formally resigned on 23rd of September after agreeing to do so on the 18th of September. I continue to be an non-executive director of Optimus, but can confirm that I do not receive any remuneration for this role. I do not have a prejudicial interest, and therefore I have been advised that I can participate in the debate and vote on the matter. Thank you, Anthony. I think we'll be hearing more statements on that uh, as we move <laughs> forward in the year. Every exec, I suspect. <laughs> uh, moving on to item 48, public, <coughs> public question time. Five, I think you've got one. Thank you very much. Uh, at the executive meeting in September 2013, the executive delegated authority to create an overarching holding company to sit above all council <coughs> companies, and as part of this, stated that no remuneration for directors would be proposed. Why has this changed, and why are you now being recommended to agree payments to non executive directors? of WBC Holdings Limited. Uh, thank you, Claire, for your question. Um, it is correct that in September 2013, the holding company was formed with a number of named individuals appointed as company officers. These named individuals included non-executive directors, and they were not paid any remuneration in relation to the duties they would perform on behalf of the holding company that were in addition to their existing roles, for example, on the executive. One of the original purposes of the company was to provide direction and accountability to the subsidiaries, and this has required considerable more time and input than was originally anticipated. As with any new concept, it was recognised that the council would learn as it went along. This learning has led to strengthening the corporate governance in that the board of the holding company has changed and is now solely composed of members with sufficient time and experience to focus on the companies. The executive delegated authority to allow the council's companies to make payments to me members acting as directors in July 2012. Executive further authorised the holding company in January 2014 the power to appoint the officers of the council's companies, including to itself. With this comes authorisation of remuneration. In the continuing interest of transparency within the Council, this has been notified in the September 2014 Executive Report, which we'll be covering later. The simple answer is that the position hasn't changed. The original named individuals in the September 2013 report agreed to take on the additional work at no remuneration. It has become apparent that the board of the holding company requires a separation from the subsidiaries and, where possible, from corporate duties. Accordingly, the holding company has determined a board representation that it believes best serves the council and its residents. I'm sure you have supplementary. I do. Yeah, thank you very much. How many individual directors will now be eligible to receive £6,095 per annum for the roles that they take and the taking on the holding company? Um, clearly, I can't tell you. Off, I, I don't want to give you an incorrect answer. Um, we'll find that we'll have that answer and send it to you. I, I don't think it's just how many directors are they all? Um, across the, all the companies. No, holding company. The holding company, uh, I think, four, I'm just, I'm just um, 
It's um, it's John Holso, Stuart Munro, Norman Jorgensen, David. David. Well, yes, it's five at the moment. Um, and you'll confirm it. Yes, we'll confirm it. Thank you very much. Right. Um, no more public questions, so we'll move on to member questions. Um, crew? Good evening, everybody. Um, the proposal for double handed calls will increase the cost by as much as £336 a week. This is the item on um, consultation on changes to charging for adult social care services. Uh, this is potentially a huge additional cost. What happens to the care package for people who cannot afford to pay this amount? but whose finances don't qualify them for assistance. Uh, I'll pass on to Bob. Thank you very much, Prue, for your question. You're quite right to point out that the potential additional weekly cost could be as high as £336, although our current assessment is that only about six people in the borough will be affected to that extent. It's more likely that the social <coughs> contributions will be less than that for most, it, I would point out uh, that the proposal for consultation ensures the safeguarding of, uh, in, in, and that no one will pay more than an additional £50 a week in the first year. The fundamental point, however, remains one of affordability. The scenario in this question appears to be paradoxical in that in the imagined circumstances, the person is both means tested and not eligible for the financial support and at the same time not able to afford to pay for the service provided. The point of the means test is to determine whether the person is able to pay, able to pay for and contribute to the cost of the service. <coughs> it follows therefore that if they are assessed as not eligible for, for financial support, they must be able to afford to pay for the services. So it appears that you're talking really about a definition of affordability. The criteria, as put forward in government guidance, is clearly set out in the report. In a nutshell, those with more than 23,250 in savings will be expected to pay the full cost of the care. This is the standard definition of affordability that's used all over, and it's universally used in areas which we are responsible for. Moreover, for those receiving double-handed care, and that's what the question's about, the cost remains good value when you set the only realistic alternative option of moving into a care home or nursing home. That would be the only alternative but for purchasing these extra services. I should point out that the financial assessment for care homes can include the value of your home as well as your savings and of course with these charges your home's value isn't taken into account. So, so to summarise I can confirm that no one will be asked to pay more than they can afford for the care which they receive. I'm sure you've got something to um, I have because there is I think you'll agree a difference between being asked to pay £50 a week extra and suddenly being asked to pay £336 a week extra which is the ultimate aim, um, however many much savings you have, that is quite a shock to the system. And it wouldn't actually take very long for people to use up all their savings at £336 a week. You'd probably be talking about 18 months, um, and they'd be below the threshold. Um, so if you're not thinking about it from the point of view of the person and the shock to them and the difficulty that they're going to have managing to find that money, once their savings are gone, they are entitled to financial help. So surely your financial projections are going to be too optimistic because after about 18 months, you're going to have to help them anyway. Yeah, I, we haven't been able to work that out because we don't know what's going to happen as a result of this increase and how it's going to apply over a long period. But we still want to make sure that we have fair and equitable means of these daycare charges as well, and, and, and as well as these charges. And this is one, amongst others, which we want to get on a sensible basis in accordance with the instructions that we're asking you to recommend here. Thank you, and uh, I'd just like to add to that, 
it, it's quite clear that we're not talking about hundreds of people here. We're talking about very few people. And so if they do burn off their savings, it's not going to be a significant drain uh, on the, the council funds. Yes, it's so, es estimated at six. So, okay. can we move on to the next question, uh, Kay? Thank you. Um, it's about the targeted youth service and children's centres item number 51. Why does the report say nothing about what happened to the services which are no longer provided? Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Gabriel. Um, um, Gilbert, for your question. Um, I'll try with the mic and see how I get on. Um, the report before the executive tonight meets the requirement for the evaluation of the new targeted youth service. Which, be, which has been established following the service planning process, which um, went into effect um, from the current financial year. The report considers uh, the impact of the newly targeted um, function and illustrates its activities. Prior to the executive meeting and the formal report being submitted, a draft report was received and supported by the cross-party steering group, which oversaw the changes over the last 12 months. Um, section 8 of the report, uh, page 38 and, uh, 39 and 40, in fact does refer to the continuing work uh, with voluntary um, services, and including Duke of Edinburgh, etc. On, uh, on, on that basis, the targeted youth team leader is also in touch with other projects, including those in Bromash, Silverdale, uh, Twyford and Finch Hampstead. Some professional support has been given and some posting to Berkshire Association of Clubs for Young People. Um, BACYP is an independent organisation which provides support to youth leaders and young people developing up, um, new opportunities for both. So Woking Borough Council has focused this work on identified priorities um, but, still, but still giving help to other organisations operating more broadly. Thank you. Um, has this change in in, in sort of uh, targeted and non-targeted. Has it made any difference to the um, different uh, um, organisations such as CAMS and things like this? Has that been taken into account? Has it made an effect, uh, you know, a, a nasty effect on that, if you like, um, by taking away the support that the ordinary youngsters who have no special needs or things um, have uh, been left with. Um, I, th I think what I can say is, is the, the work that is going on in the targeted work is very specific and, and many of the young people that have been worked with have a huge number of different needs and you can see that in the report. Yes. So they, um, they are being referred from lots of different agencies um, which is really positive. <coughs> um, and shortly we're going out to recommission um, our, our CAMS contract. And, um, and that is a really good opportunity in order to pick up some of that work as well. So um, if you've got any feedback and if you've heard anything from any of your residents and young people, then I'd ask you to, to bring that to either myself or to Judith Bernstein, the Director of Children's Services. Thank you very much. Uh, Lindsay, you're up. Yes, I hope I don't miss out the most important part of my question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, will you publish and maintain in one place on the council website a current list of all the directors of the council owned companies, their roles within the company, date of appointment and annual remuneration? Uh, thank you, Lindsay, for your question, uh, which quite rightly talks about transparency of directors of council owned companies. Your approach about transparency is absolutely consistent with the views of the administration. I would also agree with the scope of what should be published. That is why we've had a web page providing exactly what you have requested for several years. In fact, it goes further than your list and provides full financial reports as lodged with the company's house. Um, clearly, uh, based on your question, you're not aware of this page, uh, but you can find it by searching for companies. Uh, but to save you time, the web address is uh, www.working.gov.uk slash council slash companies. And I've just looked at my printout of the website and I can answer Clive. I can answer your uh, question directly. It is fine. It's on the website. Thank you. Do you have a supplementary? <coughs> yes, okay. Um, 
Okay, then if your answer is yes, uh, then why did you vote against disclosing that information at last week's council meeting? Uh, as you know, that was a, a bit of a, a, a motion in the workings of the council it was a bit shambolic because we'd never been in that position before. Um, we were voting no for that motion, uh, against that motion, because it was much, much broader than just simply uh, having the information up here. And if you recall, uh, you were actually told during the motion that the information was up on the website. I think it was Pauline who did it. Thank you. Right, that's the end of the uh, questions. So, in, so, end of the questions. We move on item 50. Consultation on changes to charge <coughs> for adult social care services, pages 16 to 29. Uh, I guess that's you, Bob. Thank you. If I could just spare a few moments to point out one or two items and to really explain what the objectives are. The, object, the objectives are to ensure that we have equity, consistency and fairness, and the services that are affected are given on page 17. And the recommendation we're asking is that um, the information that is gained through a consultation should come back for further debate and for a final decision. It's important to stress too that the changes are about non-residential care charges and do not include registered care homes. They don't come into it at all. And neither does this proposal or any parts of it affect the right that people have to have a free assessment of the services that they need. At present, some of the charges are subsidised and others are not. And it's unfair that some of them should be subsidised and some shouldn't. It doesn't make sense and this paper sorts that out. It recommends that we phase in the charges up to the full cost. These will only apply to those who can afford to pay, of course. This is determined by the national formula, and I won't go into the intricacies and details of it now, but it does mean that anyone with savings over 23,250 is considered as able to pay for the full cost of the services they receive, and not uh, those that are subsidised and uh, provided at reduced figures, and that's what we're putting right in this paper. Uh, the complications of the uh, 23,250 and what happens below it and where that finishes are all mentioned in the paper, and I won't bore you with them again. Uh, another point to be noted about this particular aspect of the charges is that the house value isn't taken into account at all. It's only the amount of savings that you've got. The paper gives all the details of the services and um, we want to start the consultation as soon as we can and it will be in line with the recommendations that are here and we'll be bringing it back when that consultation was finished. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, it, I think an, another point also just to be made to make is that the... Um, it must be confusing to our residents to not understand, uh, is this subsidised, do I get some money off or not? Mm -hmm. And I think the whole concept of uh, equality and fairness is something that's uh, uh, long needed. Uh, so, any questions for uh, Bob? Uh, Thank you. Um, it's not really a question, but um, it's about the consultation, and I just want to ensure that um, obviously, some of the people that are using these services may not have access to the usual routes of um, consultation, i.e. Uh, the internet or, or perhaps uh, receiving newspapers um, and, and things like that. So really my request was that um, we engage in perhaps a different way of consultation for, for, for the residents that are already using these services and make sure that all of them um, are involved in this consultation. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that we do that. Um, the, the usual ways of doing it are by visits from our staff, by events that we att attend, by letter and through the media as well. But we will add to that other means that you've suggested. Any other questions? Uh, it's, it's probably more than a question. Um, I'd just like to put on record reassurance I've had previously about double-handed calls. 
um, I've had some reassurance that um, if people do have double banded calls, um, they, they, there is some monitoring to make sure that the people who are actually being paid for the calling are not taking advantage of the elderly person who's giving double banded treatment. I've had that assurance before. I wanted to make sure that was. Uh, yeah, we will be able to do that. Uh, any other comments? John? I, I, I'd just like to say I am pleased I am to see that um, where we got the burden of reduced grants and more people qualifying for this type of thing, that uh, people who have bought their own houses and made the sacrifice to do that are not going to see the money just disappear. Yes, I just really wanted to, 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 to welcome the, the, the difficult area and um, very sensitive, but I think the, the principles of uh, fairness and equity and trying to be consistent I think is important. We are, as uh, everyone knows, in situation and that difficulty is not going to get any easier in the foreseeable future um, and so I think this is something that's necessary um, even if we were not imagined it would be necessary. Thank you. Thank you. If there's no more questions I'll move to the votes. Can I see for those who can vote? Mm. All those in favour? That's unanimous for the ones that are here. So moving on to 51, targeted youth services and children's centres are already being um, asked. A question? Uh, page 30 to 56. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a very detailed report, and as mentioned before, um, we had a, uh, a group that was looking at all of this work throughout the year. Um, a report was taken to the executive in July um, last year. This report made recommendations around the remodelling of our children's centres and services and the focusing of our youth service from universal to targeted. There is a real need to make our services more sustainable and deliver more impact uh, for all of our users to ensure that they're also reaching our most vulnerable. Um, in this report, uh, page 31, it outlines what was already good about our services, and, and there was a lot that was good as well, um, and the changes that we've also made. And halfway down the page, um, I'd like to draw your attention to uh, the good summary of the positive impacts that those services have made um, since, since we've made the changes. Um, only one year on, um, we've, we've made a lot of, of, of um, great changes and also the report outlines the next steps going forward from, from here as well. Um, in the youth service, um, I think it's, it's good to outline this report that 91% of the young people um, have completed their interventions um, and that's a very high proportion, so I think that's, that shows what excellent work, work our youth support um, team are, are providing. On page 39 of the report, um, also I just wanted to draw attention to the, the fact that the team have helped to facilitate and coordinate um, our Young Explorers um, group. Uh, they're, they're a club of young people with additional needs um, to go on a residential trip to Germany. Um, and you'll also see some um, really positive comments from, from parents uh, about that trip. Um, page 40 of the report, you will also see some very positive outcomes for our young people as well. There are lots of different things, but I just thought I'd highlight um, a, a few of those. Um, young people have been helped into education, employment, and, <coughs> and or training. Um, they've been helped with rehousing, and also um, they've been um, supported um, if they've been at risk uh, of child sexual exploitation, and, and much, much more. So I think lots of very positive feedback. And also throughout this report, we've seen the voices of young, young people coming through as well. Um, within the children's services, um, there have also been lots of very positive changes as well. Um, we've seen a, I think, a really positive increase in the number of um, people accessing uh, children's centres, um, and that's called the, the REACH. Um, we've seen 100% uh, of all families involved with children's social care accessing children's centres, 100% um, of all male carers accessing children's centres, and also 100% of all Gypsy Roma Traveller families um, in their geographical areas, also accessing children's centres. Um, so as you can see, um, there's been a lot of really excellent work going on. So I'd like to recommend this report. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, just before I open the questions, uh, having been involved with the, the Woodley end of this, um, I can say that certainly our, our youth club has been incredibly re-energised and working with a very, very strong church organisation. Um, that doesn't mean they're, they're um, pushing religion down, down their <coughs> shoulders and they, they're actually getting more people and they're actually training some of the individuals to come and help them as youth support workers, which I think must be good. Uh, any questions? 
Andrew? Just a thought, in so looking through this uh, report again, uh, whether the uh, children's centres have links with uh, the likes of scouts, uh, air cadets, sea cadets, uh, army cadets, who also do work a lot with, with some of the, uh, what you might have referred to here as targeted people. Um, I, I would have to check precisely which groups, but um, that would be the youth um, support team that would have those links. Um, but if you have an exact list of which associations it, um, and groups, then I could check for you. Any other questions, comments? We'll move straight to the vote. Uh, all those in favour? That's uh, unanimous. So let's move on to um, Superfast Broadband for opening. This is a paper on top up. Anthony? Yes, thank you. Uh, this is, uh, we provided some money to uh, get us to somewhere around 94%, and this is a top up to get us um, further up towards 98%. Um, the amounts um, are in the paper. It is mainly based around the ability to use wireless broadband to reach those hard to reach communities, or those hard to reach houses, which tend to be in rural areas. Uh, or I think twice, I think um, it's another area that Creative, I believe, is a bit poorly um, served by broadband. But um, I'll take any question. <coughs> Question for an observation. As somebody who lives in a super fast area already, um, I very much support the fact that some of the rest of the borough is going to be getting a bit of investment <coughs> to get businesses and, and individuals up to the same standard. Um, similar statement for me. As a uh, borough businessman, I can report that small and medium enterprise across the borough really value this initiative. And it's also a very tangible result of the borough's collaboration with the Thames Valley Enterprise. Local Enterprise Partnership. Um, so it's really good stuff. Thank you. Can I come back? Just uh, the, the point you make about the business community, we have a lot of small, small businesses uh, throughout our borough and all of our wards. Um, and this is very much an initiative that is designed to help them to help themselves to Absolutely. Be, be profitable and successful. Well, it's great value for money. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, I see this as a very much a good news item. Um, in my ward, there are rural parts, and I know there's a lot of people who work from home, uh, as businesses or as part of their, their work. Um, I just wonder how we get the information out to them to advise them about access to um, these, other than plugging into the wall type, mm -hmm. uh, access to, to, to these faster facilities. I, I'm assuming based on presentations that have been made to us that there will be a degree of evangelism and that we'll go out and seek out people on the basis that we must know where the coverage isn't particularly good um, and I presume that there will be direct mail and contact for these people. Yeah, just on that point, um, I'm sure the providers, <laughs> the broadband providers are not going to be quiet about this. <laughs> they, they will be making lots of noise. John? Um, I really got clear and interested on the question I'm asking. I noticed that Arpita was unfortunately 2015, and if you look at the number of people who are registered, they are the highest. Is there anything you can do to accelerate that? I'll take that on the way, but um, I don't have an answer for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, if there's no more questions, comments, I'll go straight to the vote. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Move on to the next one. Uh, item 53, new ways to access and improve the democratic support systems of the council forum. Um, I think this is relatively self-explanatory. We'd like to um, purchase a new piece of software called Modern Gov. Um, it's a great way of improving access for both the public and for councillors to information. It will give much better search facilities and it will improve transparency, I think, which is, I think, good news. Um, it also includes some workflow, so we don't end up with the wrong version of the papers at the wrong places, which I think will help everybody. Um, I also think there'll be some uh, savings in the longer term. There aren't savings in the one that was put in, 
but in year two and current and for the future, future years, we think it will probably pay for itself because a lot of people who get extra agendas for meetings that they don't necessarily go to, they'll be able to access them online through iPads, mobile devices, and on the web. Um, and finally, I'd just like to say that it was actually reviewed by a cross-party working group. Um, thank you very much. And got a lot. It was a very small and perfectly formed cross-party working group, but it was a cross-party working just group. Just the two of them. And got unanimous support there as well. So uh, thank you, Pauline. Um, I particularly like the, um, the new capability of when a, 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 a new item goes up on the website, you automatically get notified. That's something that's been around for that concept has been around for a long, long time. So it's nice that we're catching up. Any questions or comments? Thank you, Chair. I'm all for greater transparency, and um, with this new technology, I was just wondering, do you think it will lead to um, less freedom of information requests because um, it will be easier to access data on, on, on the internet, on the website. Very good question, Carla. I really don't know. Um, I haven't looked at the, uh, at the summary of what freedom of information requests we currently get in terms of content. I'm not even sure I'm allowed to. So I don't know, but it's an interesting other place where it might, uh, where it might save some money. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? I'll move straight to the vote. All those in favour? It's unanimous again. The next one, item 54. Shared internal audit service inclusion of corporate investigations, page 66 to 68. See you again, Pauline. Thank you. Um, this is a request to include um, internal audit services in the shared in corporate investigations in the shared internal audit services we already have with Windsor and Maidenhead. There's quite a lot of changes in the investigations area with some bits being centralised uh, to look to central government, the Department of Work and Pensions. Um, this will allow us to um, have a more, have a larger group of staff who could share work better with the changes that are happening anyway. Um, and I think it will improve the, uh, improve the management and also the, the skill level by having a larger group. Otherwise, I think we'd be below the level of the staff that we could support as a council ourselves with the centralisation of some of the work to DWP. Um, I just would note that the service will be hosted by Workingham, um, staff will be subject to 2P, and if the, um, um, or the arrangement is terminated at any point, the staff will be 2P transferred back. So there's no liability ongoing to the council. Any uh, questions or comments? Um, I, I just want... Oh, John, no, John, you go first. Okay. Yeah, I, I just wanted to know... Um, whether there's been savings recognised. There doesn't seem to be any in the paper. No, no, no savings. Uh, actually, that's really my question. It, it seems to me that it's an um, improved service uh, activity rather than savings activity. It assumes that the Department of Work and Pensions has discussed it. <laughs> the same level as we would. <laughs> which, has been, which has been the subject of a few conversations, actually. Which, which is something that I would doubt. We are constrained within our questions. <laughs> the other question is when we get our share of the money back. Mm. So, if there's no more questions or comments, I'll move straight to the vote. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Item 55 Strategic Acquisition of Property. 69 to 71. See you, John. Yes, thank you. Um, okay. um, basically, we have uh, five effective uh, properties that don't meet the decent home standards. Um, they're of non traditional construction, so there's not much point in trying to bring them up to that standard. Um, sitting in the middle is one of them that we sold. Uh, by buying that back, it allows us to build. I think it's 12 decent homes on the site, which means we can house, um, uh, not only house people in decent houses, but we can house another six families. And that's the reason this has come forward. I know there's a, there's a part two on this. Um, so if, if we want to talk about part two, you'll obviously do it when we get to the other uh, part two item, if that's acceptable to everyone. Uh, yes, I, I don't need to deal with part two as soon as I just really wanted to recommend this in principle because it seems to me it's part of what we have discussed previously, which is the 
using where we have older properties that are sitting on reasonably large sites. We are able, through doing this, to actually do exactly what you said. Um, we use our land better, use some of the money that we can access uh, to the housing revenue account. <coughs> and it seems to be a good, good thing all round, and hopefully we will do more of it elsewhere. Right, um, so if there's no more questions or comments, um, I'll uh, go straight to the vote. All those in favour? No. Right, so uh, moving on to item 56. Uh, Council and Company's business, 72 to 77, there is part two. So, um, so shall we concentrate on the part two, the non part two section? If there's any questions or comments? No. Okay, can I just, yeah. just one point? I, 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 I do welcome um, the replacement of officers with members because I do believe it's inconsistent with their role to act as directors on, on what is in fact our commercial companies. Uh, thank you John. Um, and there is just a, for everyone to note on page 73 um, uh, a slight inaccuracy uh, halfway down it says the sum of £6,000 to councils it's actually £6,095 so if you can correct that so, um, do, do um, members wish to comment on the part two? Otherwise, we'll move straight to the recommendations. Okay, so you can see the recommendation on page 72. Uh, changes in directorship, the budget monitoring position, and agreed payments in, in line uh, with the grid. Uh, all those in favour? Thank you. So that's uh, unanimous. I think that actually concludes the meeting. Thank you very much.